Well, I also think that Christianity has the best, the most thoroughly developed philosophy of evil. So I think that's a big advantage. So, um, but yeah, I mean, if you think about religions as at least in part variations of hero mythology, which they are in part, then it, it, it's a story that can be told a thousand times in a thousand ways. I mean, that's what a movie is. If it's an adventure movie, it's always a hero myth of some sort. I mean, Christ, they're, the ones we have now are almost purely archetypal, like all the superhero movies. Those are archetypal right to the core. You know, and it's funny because I know a comic book artist or, or author. He writes Batman and, and Wolverine, and um, there's a community that the comic figure serves. So if it's Batman and you're a writer for Batman, you don't just get to do anything with Batman. There are Batman rules, and the whole community of Batman fans they know the rules. And so if you muck about with Batman, then they tell you. So Batman is actually an archetype that's been generated by the collective, right? And they all feel, well, that's not quite right. Well, how, why do you feel that the story isn't quite right? Well, the answer to that is like a platonic answer is, you know the story. You just don't know that you know the story. And so when someone tells you the story properly, you think, wow, that's the story. It's like lock in, lock, key in lock. Which is fascinating. And, then, or, and is your argument then that we know it's right when we see it because it's so ancient and, and oh, yeah. ingrained in us on so many levels, Absolutely. biological and social? And yeah, that, and that's the other thing. So there's, Piaget had this idea of uh, equilibration. Man, it's a smart idea because Piaget, I don't know if you know this or not, but the motivation, Piaget's motivation was to bridge the gap between science and religion. And he had very intense messianic experiences when he was a young man. Yeah, yeah, so no one ever teaches that about Piaget. Piaget is way more interesting than you think. Piaget was very interested in the origin of morality. And he traced the origin of morality back, in some sense, to the rules that govern social interactions. Okay, so you can think, Piaget thought it really got going once kids were able to play games with each other that had a shared goal. Okay, so that was kind of Piaget's definition of a game. It's like, there's a bunch of people cooperating and competing in relationship to a mutually agreed upon goal. So like a monopoly game, you know, you want to get all the money. It's like, why? Because everyone agrees that that's what we're doing. So it's like, that's an artificial dominance hierarchy. We just whipped it up on the fly. Here's the top value. We'll play it out. So then we're playing with this kind of dominance hierarchy, right? And you get all sorts of information about people doing that. And you also, you know, clue yourself into the nature of dominance hierarchies and the way that they can be constructed, even somewhat arbitrarily. Now, what Piaget noted was that children could play together and they could get along and they could pursue the goal. But if you took them out when they were young, out of the context, and you asked them what the rules were, well, they didn't know, because the, the rules were actually the behavioral patterns that all the kids had agreed upon one way or another. They, they didn't sit down, codify the rules, and then act them out. They acted out a coherent action pattern, and then when pulled from that, they couldn't articulate it. That wasn't the level at which the knowledge was Im embodied. Well, that's... That's exactly what happened to us across the course of history. It's like we learned to act before we learned the rules for how we acted. It's exactly the opposite of a rationalist perspective, by the way. And Nietzsche was the first person to really point this out. You know, he said that a philosophical, a philosophy is the unconscious confession of a philosopher. So, and here you can think about this in terms of, of the story of Moses, too. It's like Moses realizes the rules, right? Because God gives them to him. Well. Before Moses gets the rules, he spends like years in the desert as judge. Like all the Israelites who are always scrapping with each other, they get into a fight, they come to him and say, okay, who's right here? And he's doing that like all day for years, adjudicating. So his mind is assembling all of these instances of moral conflict. And he can recognize patterns. Well, one day, it's like it's a blinding flash of illumination. It's like, oh, these are the rules that we're following. It's the translation of the behavioral knowledge into abstraction. Now, you know, Moses is a composite character. 
Although, you know, there are many stories about the original lawgiver. It's not the original lawgiver. It's the original law observer. Like we're our own wolf pack. We're, we're anthropologist or, or ethnologist and wolf pack at the same time. Oh, well, here we are doing things. What are we doing? Well, we watch. Then we make stories out of it. This is what we seem to be doing. What do those stories mean? This is what they seem to mean. Oh, those, those, are, those are rules. They're articulated descriptions of behavioral patterns. We must be following them. It's like, well, now we're following them because we know what the rules are. Before, we were just acting out the equivalent embodied pattern. So, and you know, the, like the conspiracy theorists, you know, the people who say, well, you know, this is all about control by the upper classes. It's like, they assume that you can just generate up some arbitrary rules that happen to serve you and then enforce them on a community as well. No, M partly, but fundamentally, no. You know, because that, that's, not, that's not biological thinking. You know, that's dawn of the industrial age thinking or something like that, or post-agricultural thinking. Who cares about that? You know, let's go back to when we lived in trees. We'll go back 60 million years and start talking about who we are from that perspective. And that's just a start. We're older than that. So you, you just, it's too, it's way too narrow a view. It's not informed by biological reality. So um, when you mentioned the Moses story as the law giver versus law observer, and then I was thinking of the actual biblical story mm -hmm. of where God speaks to Moses, mm -hmm. then my inner Dawkins, or my inner enlightenment yep. rationalist yep. is saying, Okay, all well and good, but why do you need this ridiculous sky figure who... He's a representation of the dominance hierarchy. That's the father. It's like, why not? Okay, that, let's talk about that, what is it? Agency detection module. Okay, first of all, that's a stupid way to conceptualize it. It is not an agency detection module. It's not some little gadget that's stuck to a computer. It's really deep. Okay, so let's think about who we are. Monkeys, where do we live? In a dominance hierarchy. What's a permanent element of the dominance hierarchy? The dominance hierarchy, what else? Well, males, females, and you. Okay, so we're gonna say, what's the world made out of? Males, females, and you. Why is the world made out of that? Because no matter where you go, no matter when, no matter how far back in time, those are things you can rely on. So then, so now we have this circuit. It's the brain. It's like, well, what are males like? Well, what are females like? And what are we like? And how do we interact? Okay, so there you get the constituent elements of reality. So first of all, it's just social, but it's complex because the males aren't just singular figures. Like the father isn't an individual. The father is the whole patriarchal dominance hierarchy, right? The individual is just a representation of that. So our minds are more evolved to consider masculinity as such rather than the male individual. Jung would say of Freud's problem patients that they confuse their own fathers with the masculine. The masculine's like a god. You say, well, is it a god? It's like, well, it shapes your behavior. It determines your destiny. It determines your, your fitness. Is it alive? That's a good question. Depends on how you describe alive. So, okay, so we've, we've got this system that can recognize like the masculine living thing, the feminine living thing, the self living thing. Well, that's the underlying presupp presuppositions of our nervous system. That's the world of being. Okay, at some point our cortex inflates. So now we can use abstraction. But you know that evolution is a conservative process. You don't just build a new thing. You, call, you build a new thing on an old thing. And so the new thing still thinks like the old thing, but it can do some more things. Well, so what's happened, what's happened to us, and this is something that's amazing to me, is that we've taken these basic social cognitive categories and we've been able to map being itself using the same categories, and it works. You map the masculine onto the dominance hierarchy. You mask, map, map the feminine onto nature well, that works. All of a sudden, that works. It's like you can, you can survive like that. So you think, well, is that a metaphor? It's like, no, it's not a metaphor. And here's an example. Why is Mother Nature 
Mother Nature. Well, what's nature? Well, nature is that which selects. That's like as far as I can tell. It's, how else are you going to define nature? Nature selects. Women select. 